I added this introduction because I forgot to mention a few things and it was easier for me to just try and go back and re-edit the video. Uh, <clears throat> this segment talks about uh, what happened in a two-year period between 1903 and 1904. That was the crucial time when this theft began. Uh, what makes this presentation difficult is that the vehicle code is like a maze because the language has been bastardized. Now, uh, the document in question back then was called a certificate of registration. But when people hear the word certificate, they think of like a piece of paper, like a birth certificate, a certificate of title, something you could fold up, put in an envelope. But the certificate of title that was used for two years was a piece of cardboard. It was issued as a placard and it had a dual function. Not only was it a certificate, but it was also the registration plate. So for those two years, that document called the certificate of registration was also the registration plate that displayed the registration number. And at that time, a vehicle had a license plate on the back. But this license plate, if you were around back then, this would have been your operator's license. So the vehicle was displaying two numbers. It was displaying its uh, registration plate, because it had the registration number, called the certificate a registration but this metal plate this would this would have been your actual operator's license and this uh, piece of metal covered in porcelain enamel would have came with a separate uh, handheld document like certificate to, to verify that this license was issued to you and then in 1905 this plate was repurposed and this plate became the registration plate for the vehicle. I have to explain, but that's all going to be explained in the next part, what took place starting between 1905 and 1918. I just wanted to clarify that the certificate of registration that was issued for two years was issued as a placard, a piece of cardboard. that had a dual purpose and was also the vehicle's registration plate. Uh, you have to be careful when uh, when something is given a label, like a document. Uh, if a document has more than one function, then that label could be deceptive. For example, is this a coffee cup or is this a tray? So call cookies. I mean, this device here has a dual function. So if you just called it a coffee cup, well, that's only telling part of the story. Uh, for example, uh, is this a car or is this a truck? Well, it's a half breed, half and half. And Ford called this a ranchero. I believe this is a 1957. I mean, if you're using it in a truck, then I guess this becomes a truck. Then if you're going to just use it for basic transportation or basic travel, then it's going to be used as a uh, like the family car. Now, we all know this is the Swiss Army knife, but to stig to give this thing a stigma and call this a knife, I mean, that's deceptive. That's wrong. I mean, this should be called an all-purpose utility tool. Because if you were using this as a screwdriver, then this became a screwdriver. Or you could be using it as a knife, then it's a knife. But to label this as a knife, uh, to me that's uh, deceptive labeling. Now, the concept of registration as done today was never needed. People fail to realize that a vehicle comes from the factory with a certificate of origin. You're not allowed to have that document. That document is confiscated and it's replaced with a certificate of title. But if you want to buy a bobcat, uh, it's 
identification plate is bolted to the outside of the machine therefore it's a marked vessel and then uh, if you were to buy a bobcat so you went to the dealer paid cash then you would receive what's called a certificate of origin and one of the functions of the certificate of origin is it is the property transfer receipt and then if you would buy a bobcat you should get the certificate of origin then that's your property and that's how it used to be prior to 1903 with a vehicle uh, just like at the de bobcat dealer registration is handled in-house the state's not involved and that's how it used to be with an automobile registration was handled in-house at the dealership and you, you would go buy a, a vehicle you would receive a certificate of ownership and you're good to go the state was not involved in you know swapping documents around but the state got itself in as the middleman between seller and buyer for one reason to commit theft one last piece here i could call this trivia we're all familiar with this sticker that the dealer places on the back of the vehicle and i guess people think that that's so a dealer can get some free advertising but this was a legal requirement at one time that by law the dealer had to identify uh, the place where the vehicle came from For example here's a nameplate uh, from 1937 from the Packard Motor Car Company and if you take notice it says vehicle number it also said delivered by so the initial point of sale the place of origin where the vehicle was, was sold when it was new was stamped on the plate even you know what city and then later on that part that element was taken off this plate and then the dealer was allowed to put it separately as a sticker on the back of the vehicle well i think i've covered enough this is i just wanted to clarify that the certificate of registration that was issued for that two-year period was issued as a placard made out of cardboard one last thing i want to discuss here before we go to the video everybody's familiar with this uh handicap placard but that name that's this generic name I guess his official name is Disabled Person Parking Placard. I'd like to have someone say that three times real fast. Disabled Person Parking Placard. Now, when if you were issued this placard and you had a vehicle next to a parking meter, if you displayed this on the rearview mirror, thereby evoking its power, then this placard becomes a tax exemption notice. Because the vehicle would be exempt from the parking meter fee for at least one hour so even though the word exemption is not printed on this placard but that's its function and to me the government they label things for deceptive purposes like so you get tunnel vision so you don't think about anything else okay let's let's go to the video The name of this video is The Legacy of Theft, and this theft took place, began in 1903, over 100 years ago. So I'm trying to condense all that history into a brief summary. And what made things confusing uh, to conceal the theft was that the language was bastardized. So I had found a way to cut through the maze and clarify what took place now the story begins in January of 1903 let's say you would decide you were going to go down and buy your first automobile 
This was cutting edge technology at the time. Uh, <clears throat> you looked inside, you see the steering wheel, levers and controls. You, the average person had no idea what these were for. That would be like you sitting behind the cockpit of a small airplane, seeing all those dials and foot pedals and had no idea what they were for. Okay. Now, so you decided to buy your first new vehicle. Well, you better bring cash. There's, there was no such thing as a car loan back then. Banks wouldn't loan money. It was too risky. So the money you were going to be using was hard currency, either gold or silver, or backed by gold or silver. And after you picked out the vehicle you wanted, it's time to go to the office and finalize the paperwork. Well, the first thing that the salesman would have to establish that you were of legal age and you were not feeble-minded. That was the word trending back then. Or a nitwit. A simpleton. Because if he suspected that you were feeble-minded, he could not sell you a vehicle because he couldn't transfer liability. Let's assume that Okay, you're of legal age and of sound mind and body. Also, you had to be of sound body. It was arduous work to operate one of these vehicles. There was no power steering, no power brakes, uh, <clears throat> no electric starter. There was a hand crank to start the engine. Uh, electric starter didn't come around until 1911. So you had to be what an able-bodied man to operate one of these. And... So the dealer had to be careful who he was selling one to because he said he had to be able to transfer the liability okay so the dealer drafted uh, two allodial documents as a companion set they were the bill of sale and the certificate of ownership both documents were notarized you would receive the original certificate of ownership and a copy a notarized copy of the bill of sale the bill of sale uh, was verified that you transferred the money to the dealer and then the certificate certificate of ownership verified that he transferred the property or the automobile to you but the dealer also had to transfer the liability because this way here later on if you uh, took off and got in an accident the dealer or the manufacturer did not want to be listed as a co-defendant. So how do they transfer liability? Well, they had to give instructions on how to use this new contraption. So you had to start it. Now, these vehicles came with a toolbox with basic wrenches. Now, they explained, well, back then there was no such thing as a gas pedal. There was a gas throttle. It was a lever on the, on the steering column. Uh, this, this had mechanical brakes, only rear wheel brakes. Now, this is where the concept of the owner's manual came about. So, to transfer liability, to make sure that you were informed. Now, you also had to sign a document, you know, verifying that the dealer in, instructed you on how to use the vehicle and so on. This way here was the typical CYO document. So he had to take all necessary steps to transfer all liability to you. So once you get behind the wheel, you're on your own. Get in an accident, it's all on you. Now this certificate of ownership back then, that was your operator's license. That's all you did it because you were the liable party. And then you were under common law, you know, under torts. Some of the other things that the dealer had to do, uh, he had to give you a copy of the local ordinances to make sure you knew what laws were around concerning, uh, you know, rules of the road. And also, some dealers, there was like a pledge card that you, you pledged to be safe and be, you know, basic use common sense. Be courteous, not to speed. So they took all necessary steps to make sure they transferred all liabilities so they could wash their hands. So, so they said, you get in an accident, they can't be listed as a co-defendant, either the dealer or the manufacturer. 
But when you bought this car in 1903, the dealer forgot to mention something to you. That in a few months, it wasn't going to be your car anymore. See, starting in 1902, the brass nameplate that was bolted on the outside of the vehicle, that was uh, concealed now under the hood or under the dash. So without that brass nameplate being in public display, that vehicle was an unmarked vessel, technically contraband. What kind of brass nameplate? Well, here's one from 1937. This is one from a Packard Motor Car Company. Uh, you see how it has the vehicle number or VIN number? The earlier brass nameplates had the model number. Because back then, vehicles did not were not given a name. They were given a model number like the Ford Model A, Model T, and so on. Because when the model number was listed, that means we're talking about a mechanical device. That's property. Okay. Now, when in order for the Commonwealth to commit theft, it had to make prior preparations to have this plate hidden, concealed somewhere. And I'm sure you know what a watermark is on a table. If a glass is left there too long, it makes a ring. Well, once that brass date nameplate was removed, that created a void. And the Commonwealth uh, gave itself a self-made excuse to fill that void with a brass nameplate made out of cardboard. I'm explaining that. So, like I said here, in 1903, uh, you bought your first new vehicle, paid cash, went through all the hoops. Uh, it was your property. You have the certificate of, of ownership, and now you're scooting down the road. But now in two months or three months, you're going to be uh, in for a surprise. By June of two, uh, 1903, the dealer issued you a, a letter in the mail, and plus there was notice in the newspaper that now you had to have the vehicle registered at the county level. So statewide registration began at the county level. Because this vehicle was, was unmarked. So to conceal the theft that was about to take place, the, the Commonwealth came up with an excuse is that, oh, well, we have to take over registration because there's too many stolen vehicles going around. All right. That was a logical excuse. However, but from day one, a motorist could have opted out to this new man, so-called mandatory registration. Let's talk about this mandatory registration. So in 1903, the Commonwealth passed into law Act Number 202 of 1903. And in the beginning of the law, there was a preamble. Now, a preamble is like a publisher's note in, 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 a, in a legislative act. It was like a publisher's note. But the publisher was allowed to, in a few words, explain what this new law was all about. Well, take notice, here's the Constitution of the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. It has a preamble. The courts have ruled that the preamble is not part of the Constitution, so therefore you can't quote it for anything. And that's why the preamble was not given a, a number. See, like here you have Article 1, Article 1, Section 1, and so on. The preamble was not given an identification number. So the courts claim because of that, it's not part of the Constitution. Well, I tend to disagree because this is creates the standing by which the people of the Commonwealth uh, got their authority to write what follows. I mean, here they were claiming that they got their authority from Almighty God, who granted them the blessings of civil and religious liberty, and they humbly invoke his guidance, they established this constitution. So they were claiming that they got their authority to draft this by Almighty God. But anyway, getting back to the preamble of Act Number 202 of 1903. Basically, it said that it was the, the reason why this act was passed into law because it was the of utmost importance 
that the public be protected against the reckless use of dangerous motor vehicles. Well, this act, the number 202 of 1903, was a hand of poker, a bluff, because it had no standing. It had no supportive legislation. The governor did not sign a declared emergency. So they skirted around a declared emergency, and they came up with this fancy term called utmost importance. But there was no footnote that linked that phrase to a declared emergency of any kind. What was wrong about this law, it created a pre-adjudication that by default all vehicles were now classified as dangerous and all motors were classified as reckless. And the terms dangerous and reckless were terms in the penal code. So what the Commonwealth did, unofficially, they criminalized owning and operating a vehicle. And that justified them to have vehicles registered. So before this Act 202 of 1903 uh, became law, like a year before, the Commonwealth had to coerce the automakers to remove that brass nameplate and hide it. They said that created a void. And then the Commonwealth now was going to fill that void with a brass date plate made out of cardboard. Now, we're going to sidestep a minute. The profanitary, he has many duties or roles. And back then, one of his roles was like the desk clerk at a hotel. So, even before the automobile uh, was invented, if you brought a stallion into the county, well then you had to have that animal register. So you had to go to the county phonetary's office, and you had to fill out an affidavit, sworn affidavit, that you were the owner, you had to list your name and address, and then you were obligated to keep your, name, your address current in case you moved, but well, that was a big fine to be arrested put in jail so this affidavit you had to uh, give your full name and address um, you had to give a description of the animal how old it was how tall it was what do you, I think you call it hands how many hands high then any distinctive markings on the animal's hide and any hot brandings I mean the, the animal was still your property but you just had to identify yourself as the registered owner publicly then for 50 cents the profanitary acting as desk clerk he handed you a certificate of registration that he signed and then um, this way you could carry it in your wallet or whatever and then if you're going to resell the animal you have proof that you were the actual owner now, if the Commonwealth wanted to take registration away from the dealer, because up until that time, registration was in-house at the dealer level. They had a, their records had to be available to law enforcement, and also copies of transactions had to be sent to the main office of the manufacturer. So if the Commonwealth wanted to take control of registration strictly to curb uh, vehicle theft or track stolen vehicles, then this desk clerk method was all that was needed meaning uh, if the brass nameplate was allowed to stay on the outside of the vehicle therefore it's a marked vessel then all the owner would have to do is uh, make a paper tracing of the full um, brass nameplate and this is why uh, brass nameplates all the information was either stamped embossed or etched so a tracing could be made so the owner could have taken that tracing up to the county profanitary and attach it to an affidavit and then the vehicle serial number would be registered and then you're good to go it would be your property there would be no need for a registration for the county to issue the vehicle registration number at all because the manufacturer's serial number was being registered 
and proof of that is with the trace. You remember, when you went up to the courthouse, you had a signed sworn affidavit. You, you gave false information. I mean, you're talking jail time. Uh, you would get in big trouble. Serious offense to have altered documents. Well, the county just came up with the excuse that they wanted to you know, curb stolen vehicles. The federal government was going to use the same excuse uh, years later in 1919. But anyway, the <clears throat> I guess the Commonwealth felt that if they removed the brass nameplate from public display, and then technically the vehicle was uh, like contraband, that that would block anyone from trying to use the desk clerk method. If anybody around back then still knew about it. Because like I said, the a lot of people owned horses back then. So the type of registration that was selected was based on Admiralty Maritime Law. And then the, the, the proprietary was no longer the desk clerk. He became a dock master. So I said, to repeat, January 1903, you purchased a new vehicle. You got the documents, but all of a sudden now, couple months later in June of 1903 you got this notice now you have to have the vehicle registered at the county courthouse well the, the county buffonetary he was now designated as the bullshit artist and he had to uh, you know capitalize on people's being dumb and stupid now he had to watch himself because even though a, a buffonetary does not have affirmative duty to make disclosure Know, voluntarily or provide legal advice but upon demand he has to articulate intent or otherwise that if he lies that he can get in big trouble so he was crossing his fingers that uh, no one was asking the right questions so if you came to his uh, desk and you were supposed to bring you know the deal issue paperwork the bill of sale and the certificate of ownership but then he told you you had to fill out an application. And historically, an application form is the devil's contract. It was known as the devil's contract. <clears throat> so he had no duty to tell you, hey, there's a, there's a different way we could do this. And in fact, the desk clerk method was even cheaper. That was only 50 cents. To do it under Admiralty Maritime Law, that was two bucks or about $40 at today's prices. Now, <clears throat> when you filled out that application form, you were getting yourself in a whole mess of trouble. Now, that application form acted as an affidavit, whereby you were making a declaration that the vehicle was dangerous, and also you were making a declaration that the vehicle was an unmarked vessel, therefore contraband. So you had no legal claim to contraband. Also, since the dealer couldn't sell contraband then that nullified his notary seals now see that's the slick move the beauty of it all the governor did not have to sign a declared emergency to, to, to give act 202 of 1903 standing because each motorist was going to sign a declared emergency one application at a time that was a slick move so people were deceived and bluffed into surrendering ownership of their vehicle so once you filled out the application form then the profanitary took temporary custody of your dealer issued paperwork and since the notary seals were now invalidated because you declared the vehicle to be contraband as an unmarked vessel and dangerous so that means the county profanitary, he put his seal, or county seal, it was a gold seal, on that document and he embossed it with, with his signature. Now he was claiming that document as county property. So when that document became county property, the vehicle became county property. That was a slick move. And, but to reassure you uh, that no theft took place, the, for the first two years, the county profanitary gave you, gave you the documents back. So, look at that. 
I'm still on the vehicle. I, I'm still in possession of the dealer-issued documents. The motorist didn't realize that once that county profanitary placed that seal on the document, it was now county property. And now it could be listed as a county asset. See, when this new boy toy came about, the the horseless carriage, uh, it was going to create it created a, a, a new demand, and you know, for road upgrades, the roads had to be upgraded to meet the new demand. Politicians did not want to raise general taxes just to benefit a few people, you know, the motorists. And back then, the majority of people still had a love affair with their horses. Some felt that this uh, contraption was only going to be a passing fad. Uh, some municipalities, because they did not want the burden of upgrading the roads, they tried to place an outright ban on automobiles. Say, look, we don't even want them in here. But uh, that was later ruled unconstitutional. So now, the politicians felt that if these motorists wanted better roads, then they're going to be paying for the road upgrades one way or another and so they figured out a way to use the backdoor approach and confiscate the vehicle from the motors without the motors being the wiser I think that was uh, brilliant you try something like that today they want to throw you in jail okay So once the vehicle was declared dangerous by your own admission, declared uh, an unmarked vessel and therefore contra illegal contraband, well, the profanitary issued you a document called the Certificate of Registration. Remember, you walked into the, his office with two documents, you're leaving with three. Well, the Certificate of Registration it was like uh, it was a placard made out of cardboard and it was coated like with resin or linseed oil I guess it to make it uh, weather resistant now for example this is a hunting license from Pennsylvania from 1952 it was made out of cardboard they had a display on the back of your jacket do you see here this big number so now imagine this hunting license was the actual certificate of registration well that certificate of registration served two functions one it listed uh, your name and address and the description of the vehicle but it also listed the registration number so this certificate of registration issued as a placard filled the void and replaced that brass nameplate that was now concealed so in order for the county to issue you this this placard made out of paper because this it had to first get rid of the original one the the, uh, the brass nameplate that was slick well so I don't forget here if the desk clerk method would have been used then the 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 manufacturer's assigned serial number would be your registration number concerning the county but because that number because that plate was concealed and you already through the application form you made a declaration that the vehicle was dangerous and an unmarked vessel as if it didn't even have an identif identification plate that opened the door for the county to issue you a surrogate or replacement So now, like I said, the second function of this certificate of registration, this was a registration plate. This was the vehicle's registration plate, and it had to be publicly displayed at all times. There is a saying that registration is confiscation by proxy. That is so true. Now, to recap so far, the Commonwealth had to make preliminary steps to pressure the automakers to remove the brass nameplate and hide it. And then that opened the door, gave the Commonwealth a self-made excuse to intervene, fill the void, and replace that brass nameplate with one made out of cardboard.
Well, this cardboard plate was only will last for two years and because they're ready for the big change in 1905. What took place between 1903 and 1904? That was only a beta test to get people uh, familiarized and accustomed with this registration process. Now, you bought the vehicle in January of 1903, so then by June, you got your letter from the dealer that, oh, you got to go in the, up to the courthouse and have the vehicle registered. And also, there was notice in the paper. So you stopped at my house and say, hey, I'm going up to the courthouse. You want to come along for the ride? I said, sure. Now, we, then we go to see the Pafonitary. And uh, the Pafonitary is, uh, they acquire a knack for psychology to control people. And if anybody starts asking the wrong questions, he knows how to disarm them. Uh, so you like second guess your position. So while I'm there, I'd say, well, I'm standing next to you. I said, uh, sir, isn't there an alternate method? The, uh, we can use the old desk, desk clerk method. He's not going to want to answer the question. And to me, that's a, that's a giveaway. He'll fly back and he'll say, who are you? Are you this man's attorney? Then, then you have no. Then uh, you should you, you should leave. You have no business being here. He's gonna you know he's gonna use his 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 position to intimidate. And then uh, I says, as long as I'm conducting myself in a peaceful and orderly manner, what's he gonna do? Call the sheriff to come kick me out? That would be another uh, giveaway that something fishy was going on. As mentioned, the Pafonitary has no affirmative duty to provide legal advice or, or volunteer any information. But upon demand, he has to articulate intent or otherwise he could be deemed incompetent. So if someone asks him a question, either he has to say, you know, yes or no. If I asked him if there's an alternative uh, registration method, I would use the desk clerk method. And if he would say no, well then if he's caught lying, he could get in big trouble. Now, if uh, he refused to answer the first question, I'd say, well, listen, um, this Act Number 202 of 1903, uh, do you have a copy of the uh, um, governor's signed declared emergency that would give this, this law standing? So again, what's he going to say? It, either he's going to say that, well, no, he can't say that a document, if he said that the, there's no such declared emergency well then then there's no compliance with this act because the act by itself has no standing again he's not going to want to answer these questions you know he's going to say look uh, are you an attorney or you don't know what you're talking about well i'm not going to get into a pissing contest with this guy and i tell you look you got 10 days to file uh to register the vehicle according to this new law act 202 of 1903 is what we're going to do i said we're going to leave so i go home and i would type up a writ of mandamus and then i would i can't file it with this county clerk because the way i'm filing an action against them so either i'd file uh, with the um, commonwealth court or i'd take it to the local federal district court and then i say hey i'm asking this officer of the court a question he refuses to answer questions and i'm asking him for a copy of the signed declared emergency by the governor so a uh, writ of mandamus is where the judge would order the uh profanitary to comply to either answer the question you know yes or no and if i'm asking for a, a copy of a document to either produce the document or admit one doesn't exist so if he would if, if I would issue this writ of mandamus and the federal court, say, would order the profanitary to answer the question or produce documents, and if the documents didn't exist to admit that there is no documents, then that would have uh, blown Act 202 of 1903 right out, out the water. Because that act was a hand of poker, a bluff, and I'm going to call the bluff. But unfortunately, no one did no one back then did that and i have another question where were the flipping lawyers i mean these lawyers knew what was going down i mean 
I don't have no formal education. I figured this out. So, like I said, I worked on this for six years. Well, so now, let's say you didn't bring me along. You were you got intimidated and you filled out that application form as you were instructed. What happens next? Well, now, uh, now that the vehicle is county property, um, you're status as the owner you're no longer an owner you're a registered owner and your status as registered owner is at the discretion of the commonwealth because they can come up with an excuse and they could remove your name as the libel party and then any property that does not have a named libel uh, named libel party is deemed abandoned therefore under maritime salvage could be could the property would revert back to the state uh we see in 1903, um, this, the vehicle code began as an administrative crimes code. And the courts were involved because with all these vehicles uh, on the road, if you would have violated a county ordinance, say, or there was um, an injury or property damage, then a tort claim, well then you were entitled to a trial by jury well the courts didn't want uh, all these citations uh, coming before them with a jury trial because that would clog the courts so they had to figure a way to handle things administratively that's why the vehicle code started off as administrative crimes code now after you filled out this application uh you declared the vehicle dangerous you uh, had admitted that it was contraband because it was an unmarked vessel it was given a county registration number therefore it's county property so now you need a license to operate county property <clears throat> now for the first two years the uh this is what the plates look like in pennsylvania they were color coded now this license plate up until 1905 would have been your operator's license and then you were issued a credential to verify that this license was issued to you and at the end of the day you were able to remove this license and then take it in the house for safe safekeeping but at all times if you had your vehicle parked on the street at all times it had to display its uh, certificate a registration because that also acted as this as, as the registration plate um, when you filled out this application for an operator's license you had to you were making a, a declaration that you were reckless and that was a criminal offense so you, you were technically pleading guilty and then you were given a suspended sentence and then you were placed on parole for a year so your operator's license was a parole card because now you were allowed to trespass on the roads you had to be a confessed criminal in order to obtain an operator's license so to have the vehicle code as an administrative crimes code the commonwealth had to criminalize owning and operating a vehicle amazing and in the early days each violation was set at two thousand dollars at today's prices so you officer arrested you for uh, violating the vehicle code instant two thousand dollar fine and the vehicle was subject to forfeiture Now, in 1903, an Oldsmobile touring car at today's prices would cost over $130,000. Uh, well, who could afford uh, such a luxury car? So the Commonwealth created the chauffeur license. I mean, if you were able to afford a $130,000 car at today's prices, you, you could afford a chauffeur. So in this way here, uh, that protected the vehicle meaning um the chauffeur was not a whipping boy 
so the violation would be against the chauffeur and and they couldn't attach you know they couldn't go after the vehicle and if you were that wealthy that you couldn't spend one hundred thirty thousand dollars for a touring car well to the wealthy people it didn't matter to them if the if the commonwealth um owned the vehicle or not because in a few years you'd be junking the car anyway because there was no market for a used luxury car because in a couple years if you're going to buy a new one well a used car dealer didn't want i mean in a couple years what how much is that that hundred thirty thousand dollar car going to be worth so usually uh if you're going to buy a new luxury car like a touring car your old one this just got junked anyway because there was no market for it who could afford i mean no one wanted to buy a used luxury car i mean that would be like a rich person wanted to be buying a pair of used shoes so now i'm trying to gear up to the big changes that took place in 1905 So now, uh, if the vehicle was listed as a county asset, all the vehicles uh, could be used as collateral to go to the local bank. The county could borrow money for these road upgrades. Well, the county was going to say borrow a million dollars. Well, the total value of all these vehicles wasn't wouldn't be equal to a million dollars. See, the banks knew what were going down because they were ready for the big swing move of 1905. Remember that for the first two years, 1903, 1904, this was the beta test. Just to get everybody custom and familiar with this new registration procedure. Well, if the county borrowed a million dollars for road upgrades, how was, how was it going to repay the loans plus the interest? Well, that's when they said they started creating violations for everything. They're all set at $2,000 a piece. And they said they wanted a lot of money in a big hurry. And uh, said the if you got arrested, you have to get an attorney. So the attorneys are making money. This was a win-win situation for all, for everybody involved, except the actual owner of the vehicle, who is now a registered owner of county property. Uh, so look, like I said, so in the end result, with the double swing move between filling out, filling out the application form at the Fonetary's office to register the vehicle and then filling out the other application at the tax office to get your, get this license. Uh, owning and operating a vehicle was now outside the realm of the Constitution. So you waived your right to a trial by jury either to have the car confiscated or if you were uh, you had to go before a magistrate remember a magistrate is not a court of record and just like the county profanitary he has several roles like being the desk clerk or a dock master that's the same thing with the magistrate now the, ma the magistrate was able to have a court held under common law or under admiralty maritime but the default is admiralty maritime and this the average person didn't know what was going down the whole system of law was 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 created to be confusing and so the average person couldn't figure out what was going on so they were of course intimidated to uh, capitulate and so like the next part of this is going to be the big changes that took place in 1905 that's when starting in 1905 all vehicles became state property up until 1918 because the i guess the big state banks saw the money potential and they didn't want to share the wealth with the local county banks remember the local county banks were owned by the local merchants and by 1929 with the crash there was like over 3,000 banks that went belly up uh, in a few days. So the local bank, owned by local merchants, they're all but gone. So now what we have today is the big international corporate banks. And most of them are affiliated with, with international banks overseas. 
So I hope to try and explain here what was taking place up until 1905. And then the next part is going to be, I consider it a real, real juicy. I mean, it how this theft took place, uh, I said, up until 1905, this is the preliminary stages. This is the beta test, just to get everybody accustomed. They let people hold on to their dealer-issued documents for two years, just to Hey, so look at that. I must still own the vehicle. I still have this. Uh, I'm still in possession of the, uh, the documents that the dealer issued to me. It says certificate of ownership, but they didn't realize with that seal that the county proprietary put in that document that that word uh, ownership, it, it, its meaning was changed. It was now owned by the, it was owned by the county. And since starting in 1905, from 1905 1918 all vehicles became state property and then the real big change took place in 1919 when all vehicles became federal property and all when this was going down the car manufacturers had to go along with the charade for because they had a monetary incentive who's going to buy a vehicle if they weren't allowed to keep it so the boys in detroit as i call them they had to devise a marketing strategy to sell the illusion of ownership. And that'll be for another video called the Detroit Ponzi Scheme. So if you have any questions, leave them in the comments below. Until the next video.